hearing, but the other thing is, is with the videotape, it just makes it easier to be able to pick up, and we will get probably quite a few views. I've had requests to see this from Kentucky and other places, so. I'll start here with John, and John, you go to Kathy, on down to Leslie, to Gabe, Jaden, and we'll let Jason go last. Unless you want to go first. It don't That's all right. You can have it if you want it. Is something about yourself? And well, I'm, I'm John Jenkinson. <clears throat> Don't even really know quite why I'm on this panel, but I'm glad to be. I, uh, uh, my practical life, I, I teach English and literature out at uh, Butler Community College. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, currently a functioning poet, a couple of up there, and uh, was reborn as a singer-songwriter after, uh, after a long life as a drummer. So uh, if you see me playing the guitar kind of like a drummer, that's probably what it's all about. And I'm going to pass it on to my lovely wife, Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Jenkinson. Um, I am an accountant and a fiction writer, and most um, I have four children. What else is interesting? <laughs> that's about it, right? Yeah, really, that's a plenty, right? You do a lot of travel, too. Um, I do a lot of travel for my job, and we do a lot of travel just because we love to travel. So, uh. Uh, Leslie Kinder, I own Launch Custom Jewelry down in Delano. I lived in De live in Delano and work in Delano, and uh, I really don't know why I'm on the panel except for that I'm a loudmouth on Facebook and extremely opinionated about the separation of church and state and how many Christians are ruining Christianity for the good Christians. And uh, we've had many conversations where, you know, we agreed on a lot of things, I guess, or we had good debates. Um, and I'm a bass player, so maybe that's part of the connection. We just figured that out today. First thing I did was go check out his bass room before I sat down. <laughs> okay, is this on? Hello, hello, hello. Yep, yeah. you're on. My name is Gabe Quisenberry. Um, I have been involved with the church at large for most of my life, from the time I was a little, little kid. <clears throat> and I will say, even on tape, that's been 50 plus years. So a long time. You know, I've seen it evolve a great deal, not necessarily for the good. Um, my background is such, like I said, I've been very involved in the church. Um, in my mid-20s, I was uh, started to become very involved in the contemporary Christian music field. Um, I'm still quasi-involved in that. And right now, I do a number of things. Um, I have lived and worked in the Hilltop neighborhood, which is a low-income neighborhood, for the last 10 years. I also work for the Sedgwick County Department on Aging, where um, I work in Plainview and Hilltop, uh, Arts Film Festival. Uh, I do a lot of work at concerts um, backstage. I uh, do a lot of street working, so I'm very, doing many different things across the board these days. Um, and this is the first time I've been in church on a Sunday morning, actually for a service in about five years. My name is Jaden Howe. Um, I'm a filmmaker and I do freelance security. And I don't really know why I'm here either, except that if there's a way to not be normal, I'll find it. <laughs> and I've got three kids. And known Mike for what a couple of years now through filmmaking, and I'm gonna pass it along here. Uh, I'm Jason. Uh, I am a writer. I write for a magazine called Naked City, which some of you may have seen around town. It's uh, it is not a salacious magazine like this panel, but it implies more of a community art. Uh, I also write for the Wichita Eagle. I do uh, mostly art, music, and um, theater-related pieces. Uh, I've known Mike for a couple of years. Uh, we guys know each other on Facebook and had a few conversations in person. I've been involved politically uh, for about the last 12 years since I've been in Wichita. So sort of the intersection of politics and social issues it, it is something that I'm interested in. And I, I think these kinds of dialogues are important. So that's why I was excited to be on the panel today and have this discussion. 
I could say something about everyone here. I met with, most of you know, I met with the mayor and vice mayor here a couple of weeks ago, and the first person I emailed or sent a message to said, hey, can you give me some heads up what to expect with Jason? So, and that went really well. Good. We talked a lot about barbecue, man. Myself and here. Oh, yeah. I know I'm here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the series has been about, uh, most of you guys know me as far as where I'm coming from and what I believe, and, uh, and I've had some good conversations with some of you. It's good to hear that uh, I think what I, what I try have, to, have tried to focus on is more so agreement than disagreements with each of you, uh, from whether that be politically or spiritually or whatever. Uh, but I, I, I think that most of you know where I'm coming from. You, you all knew I was a pastor, but I'll be at a different kind of pastor and stuff. But the series has been, why they like Jesus and not the church. Uh, we did a thing on fundamentalism, we've done a thing on homosexuality, on the women, uh, just a variety of topics. And uh, you're all here because I value your opinions. And that, that's why you're here. And to think about that statement, uh, people generally like Jesus, but they have issues with the church. Would you agree or disagree with that, and why? <laughs> I would definitely agree with that. Uh, I think that when you think about Jesus, it is a message of hope. It's a message of lifting you out of where you are right now, and it's a message of looking forward and thinking you can be better, your life can be better. And I think especially right now with what's going on in this country, that's a message that really resonates with people. You, tar you start talking about some of the followers, though, and that's where you, it gets a little dicey, because the leader can be very attractive, but some of the followers um, might get in your way. They might be too judgmental because you don't fit a certain label. They might uh, not like certain things that you think. And maybe you're not a person who fits in well with groups or fits in well with um, religion as an institution. So that's where I think the problem comes in. Anybody else? Because I will have an opinion on everything you say. <laughs> Um, I think saying that people like Jesus and have an issue with the church is putting it mildly. Um, but then also, you know, uh, a lot of people have a very small or limited knowledge of who Jesus was, and so they um, only focus on certain parts or certain things, and, you know, nine times out of ten, I don't see the church following the teachings of Christ. But, um, you know, there's... That's always going to happen. I mean, there's a big difference between somebody who is honestly trying to interpret the Bible um, through the translations that we have and really try to learn and teach and follow, and those people who, you know, take it out of context, make it a huge issue, um, you know, do things that are that are not uh, balanced and not Christ-like in any way. Um, so it's it's not just a simple issue, you know. And there's, I mean, I think back. I was thinking as I was preparing for today, all the different kinds of issues and problems and betrayal that I've just experienced through the last several years. Um, and it's it's very different. I mean, it's not just, you know, we don't agree with you get out. Because um, I know there's a lot of people who really think they're following Christ that I'm like, I'm not sure what I'm reading. But. So it's, it's a big issue, but it's a multi-layered issue. I'm going to speak for a moment in, in defense of organized religion and the contemporary church at large. And that is, we all like Jesus because we don't have to deal with Jesus. Jesus has been dead for 2,000 years physically, and we have one small book, and a small part of that book is dedicated to the anecdotes of Jesus. And so it's pretty easy to like him. He doesn't... Uh, make many demands upon us, really. He's not in your face like he was in the face of the disciples. Uh, so when you come into uh, an institutionalized church, which, uh, whatever church it might be, it, it's trying in its own way to deliver the message that it perceives uh, coming from this, uh, this very old figure. Now suddenly you have to deal with the exigencies of contemporary life, people's personalities, everybody's agendas, and naturally 
that's going to give us a lot more trouble than this sort of idealized figure that we have uh, in our mind about Jesus. And I'm not trying to defend the fact that I think many times non-Christian things are done in the name of Christ, but I am going to say it's really easy for us to like Jesus and not like the church. And sometimes the solution is, you know, probably just roll up your sleeves and get to work and not philosophize about it so much. Like Mike does. He pulls in the homeless. He tries to feed people. Mike and I have slightly different uh, political philosophies. That doesn't matter. That really doesn't have a whole lot to do with it. You know, if you're getting out there and you're on the ground and you're doing what counts, that's a little bit different. Anyone else? Gay touched on this, and, and anytime that anyone has something like John does, that's a little bit different. Feel free to throw that in. Some of you, what are your personal experiences? If you're willing to share that, you don't have to, but if you're willing to share what your personal experiences have been with the church, uh, that they could have done a better job at, or could have maybe you believe represented. I think John's right. We look at Jesus, but we look at Jesus. We've got essentially four gospels that we look at in the New Testament, or basically they're. Three of them are synoptic, so they're kind of the same. One's a little bit different. But, uh, uh, and, and there are things that the church has done, which is good, and it makes it a little bit more difficult because we live in the present and not in the past. But if you've got something to add, feel free to do that. But I guess the question would be, are there things that the church did in your life that they could have done a better job at? Uh, what are some things that's happened that has impacted you? If you're willing to share that, anybody? For me, the biggest issue with the church has been the church, at least the churches that I were involved in, which were not in Kansas, not in Wichita, uh, but their lack of ability to meet me where I was, meet people where they are. Um, the first instance was when I was about 12 or 15. Um, we had gone to a non-denominational church for about six or seven years, and that was sort of the center of what our life was. We went every Sunday morning, we went back every Sunday night, we went every Wednesday night, my mom was heavily involved with all the ministry, my dad was a deacon in the church, and then in about 95, 96, for multiple reasons, my parents got divorced, and um, the church, there wasn't really a place for us in the church anymore, because divorce was one of the things the church just didn't want to deal with, didn't want to talk about, and they wanted to lay judgment down very quickly, and it was basically decided that my mother was in the wrong, and that uh, my father was not. Uh, and I uh, understood why my mother wanted to be divorced, understood why it wasn't a good idea for my parents to get married anymore. So because I was okay with my parents getting divorced, I was uh, basically branded as uh, not being okay with God. So that was an example of the church not, not being there where we were, because we were not, that situation was not going to change, but we still wanted to be involved with that church community. We still wanted to you know, have that be part of our life, and it wasn't able to uh, and then simultaneously, I was starting to realize some things about myself and was starting to realize that I uh, was probably gay. And uh, the church was not able to be there for me in that capacity either. I, uh, beyond that church I went to, I went to a Christian school. And it was linked in with uh, Bob Jones University Southern Baptist curriculum. Uh, what I had told me was that gay people had demons living inside of them. So that was a difficult thing for me to try to figure out, okay, who am I, who am I with God, who am I with the church, who am I inside? It was difficult to be able to navigate all of those things. Uh, my grandmother was very active in the church. She was a Sunday school superintendent. She went to church conferences all over the state, all over the country. Um, I was raised Methodist, so growing up, I was, I wasn't even me. I was my grandmother's granddaughter, that's how people would identify me. Oh, you're Irma's granddaughter, aren't you? But she died years ago, and from then on, it went downhill without she and my grandfather in the community anymore. Um, my father was gay, and that came out when I was in junior high, maybe. And so that, that was a problem, not just in the church, but in the school and in the town and everything else. I got, oh, are you gay like your dad? Um, all kinds of stuff. I, I was a bad person because my father was gay, apparently. And 
ever, uh, I don't know why, but for some reason, some people decided that I was, I don't know what they thought I was, a witch, a vampire, something. I was chased with rosaries and crucifixes around the school. I had people from the church and from the community get jobs as housekeepers at our place so that they could snoop through my stuff when I wasn't home. They found a white nightgown and robe set and spread it around town that it was a ceremonial robe. Um, they found a little gold boot knife that I had. That became a ceremonial dagger. Um, and as far as in the church, I went, we get, our church has a big turnover in ministers. They're bad about throwing out ministers and getting somebody new if the minister doesn't go along with what the little clique in charge of the church thinks they ought to. So we, we go through ministers every couple of years. And we'd get a minister in, and they'd be perfectly nice to me. I was the church secretary for a while. I was the church janitor for a while. I kept the nursery for a while. I was active in Bible school. And they'd start out, all the ministers would be very nice to me, and we'd get along. And then all of a sudden, they'd stop talking to me. They'd start acting really weird. And I never knew what was going on. And then they'd move on to another church before I ever really found out. And a couple of years ago, we got a minister in that was a really nice guy. He came from a bigger church, and so he was not real happy with the small church politics going on. And he came to me and told me that he hadn't been there two days, but what they had come to him and told him that my father was gay, and apparently they were going out on the internet, trying to find stuff on me on the internet, and talking about what I did on the internet, I don't know what they found because I wasn't even on the internet under my real name. And that I have a degree in herbal medicine, so I was a witch because I was using herbs. Um, and this is a Methodist church. This isn't even a, you know, offbeat kind of fundamentalist thing. And he came to me and told me that they were saying that. Um, my father died in 90 four, I believe. And they're still going to every new minister, informing them that my father was gay. I don't know why this is an issue. My father died of a heart attack suddenly. And it's apparently an issue still to this day that my father was gay. Oh my God, don't talk to her. Don't let her in on anything. Don't let her keep the nursery. She might corrupt those little kids because her father was gay. I don't get that. And I quit going. After he told me that, I said, look, I like you. I have no problem with you as a minister. I wish that we had more ministers like you that had come to me sooner and told me what was going on. But I said, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't feel welcome. I walk in the door and people don't talk to me. Uh, we have church dinners. I go to the dinners and no one sits at the table with my family. And I still, I love, our church does boxes for the needy every Christmas, food boxes. And I loved going over there and filling the food boxes and helping out with that. I loved to buy things for the food pantry. I loved to make cookies to take to the shut-ins. We go Christmas caroling, and I always get involved in all that. But I just, every time I walk in the door, somebody's looking at me like I've got no right to be there, and so I just quit going. Anyone else? Oh. Sir, I need to drink after that. <laughs> uh, when I was in high school, and I'll date myself, I'm 58 years old, in the 1960s, I had a religious awakening and decided to become a Jesus freak, as we were back in those days, and I played the guitar, so I found myself playing music at youth pastor, at the youth pastor brought me in on Wednesday nights and Thursday nights, and the Saturday youth youth uh, service, and um, I read the Bible like a book. I started at the beginning, and I read it to the end, and I tried not to take out snippets and little things that were part of my personal agenda and things that I wanted to see and things that I wanted to believe and just read it like a book. And when I closed it, I felt I had an idea of what Jesus wanted for us, and I felt that I had an idea that in the totality of the whole book, that he basically wanted us to be good to each other, to try to understand each other, to lift each other up, and that we did not have to look to him or any other teachings because inside each of us is God and is Jesus. And if you listen to your conscience, 
you'll do the right thing. So I was taking a religious cl religion class and we were studying all the other religions. We were studying Buddhism and Hinduism and all that. And of course, you know, from a Western point of view, I didn't get in depth in any of it. But when I started to look at some of the Eastern religions, I said, well, they don't care if you're a Christian or a Hindu or a Jew or whatever. They look at your actions and they say, Christianity is a path to God. Hinduism is a path to God. Personal paths to God are acceptable. And so I began to question people and say, why is it that everyone has to say that Jesus is their only God or they're not going to heaven? Was that a mistake? I so did not just, yeah. that's the important thing. just the question itself. Just the question was a mistake. itself. I was the person who picked everybody up in my car, took them to church, made sure they got home, loaned them money, taught them to play the guitar, all that kind of stuff. But as soon as I said, why do we all have to think that the only way God is through <coughs> Jesus, I became a demon. And within two weeks, the youth pastor was taking me aside, asking me about my spiritual awareness, and they were all concerned about my turning to the dark side. Let me ask a question, Lizzie, I'm, I'm going to jump in on occasion on some of these. If, was there anyone willing to sit down and have a discussion to give an answer to the question? No. No, so, no, one, okay. no one talked to me about it, but they were concerned about the fact that I had questions. And the fact that I still personally think that when, when and if I find my way to heaven, that there's going to be Jews and Hindus and Buddhists and everybody else there. And so... You know, it's that basic concept that you don't have to, if you haven't heard about Jesus and you haven't met a Christian and you still lived a good life, you're not going to heaven. This, this concept just pretty much turned me away from Christianity. Every single time I get involved in a church, get in a discussion group, go to a Bible study and bring up anything that was somewhat contrary to their preconceived notions of what a good Christian is, I suddenly became evil and to be avoided. And, and then you look around and you see all of these things that people do in the name of Jesus and the atrocities that are committed in the name of all religions. And you ask yourself, is religion really the way to go for humans? Remember I said that there would be times that I would interject and say things yeah. out here. So this is one of those times. It's the reason it's important to know the answers. You should always open yourself up to questions and you should be willing to sit down and have an open discussion with those questions. Because this story is not this unique. Is... This is a very common story I hear very often in that just asking the question causes the person to be demonized and turn away. I don't. It, it's, it, my experience tells me, y'all can tell me if I'm right or wrong here, my experience tells me where there may be areas of disagreement is not as much of an issue, nearly as much as the person demonizing you for where you for who you are, what you believe, and where you're at, and then not even bothering to try to answer the question intelligently. Right. That's far, far more of an notice the head shakes. That's far, far, far more of an issue. The issue to me with Leslie is not because we can sit and I'll be glad to have that discussion with you sometimes. But the issue is not nearly as important as that as it is people that just demon, Jaden expressed the same type of thing that by association demonize you or demonize others and then have nothing to say of value other than criticism and critique. So anyway, I, hate that. I had to jump yeah, in there because... Just, yeah, I, I appreciate that. And you know, the extension of that is when you go to a church and you see someone who doesn't live a good life, who does horrible things, but the reason that they're accepted in the church is they put more money in the collection plate than anybody else. It gets a little bit unfriendly for people like me. And when you go to a church like I did, I, I volunteered for the Special Olympics in 1983, 
and it was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and that's where Jimmy Swaggart's church is. And I was interested in his music. He was a big guy at the time. I went to his church, and he preached politics on the pulpit. He said that the world was, the country was going to go to hell if Reagan didn't make it to the presidency. <laughs> While he was up there wearing a Rolex watch, a $40,000 car, he drove up in a $40,000 limo, he was like, you know, anointed by God with all of these people, you know, riches and wealth, and they passed the hat so many times. And he said, you know, he was preaching politics on the pulpit. Three days later, I come home, I'm watching CNN, he's on the national news, and he denies that he preaches politics on the pulpit. You know, this is, this is throughout the organized church, and this is the kind of thing that good Christians that need to recognize and fight against, because you are turning off people who might be good Christians, who might contribute to your church, who might have a lot more than just money and political influence to contribute to you. Well, maybe, I don't know, but for those of you that have been here through the series, one of the other topics was politics from the pulpit and how that that really is just, you know, we, we should teach the politics of Jesus. But other than that, if it has an yeah, R or a D, or a, if it has an R or an I or a D behind it, where we, we, don't teach, we don't teach party and that type of thing. So anyway. Yes, other, he was, but he was a raging liberal. <laughs> well, and again, you should say, <laughs> so that's, that's good all, that's good all. teach party is a lot more, yeah. that really covers it a lot better. Because yeah. you can't, in my opinion, if you read the Bible, you can't not be political. It's just, you know, and everything we do. But you don't attach a political party. No party uh, to that. Socially political. Socially. Let's active. move on. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, I have a little story that ties in kind of uh, to, to some of that. And, um, and, and you know, and I, I wasn't as traumatized as some of, you know, you guys are way senior. I would be way more scared. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, again, as a little kid, um, I grew up in the Methodist Church. Poor Methodist Church. Sometimes they're just really not. There's some good Methodist Church. There's some good ones. There's some weird ones. Um, but you know, I went to a Methodist Church, and I never heard the story of Jesus. <laughs> in fact, I was very involved in the church. Like I said, I was in youth group and youth choir, and was confirmed in the church, but somehow missed the concept of that was supposed to be when I was following Christ. Um, got a Bible when I was confirmed. Um, didn't know until a few years later, which is a whole other story, that Jesus was only in the New Testament, so I was trying to find him in Genesis. So, you know, I'm up to like, you know, uh, judges. <laughs> this guy, you know? Stuff too. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's so funny to me because the, the Methodist Church has a long history of being socially active and being um, supportive and somewhat, in a lot of cases, what people consider liberal. You know, I always say I'm so conservative, I ended up being liberal because I. I had no idea of things like caring for the poor or, you know, um, working with widows and orphans, that kind of thing that seems so conservative to me and so biblical that somehow that ended up being liberal. But anyway, you know, when I was a little kid, we used to do this thing in youth group called Trick or Treat for UNICEF. And I, they still do it today, but no one, it was very popular. This is this, what are you laughing for? It was a very popular thing in the 60s. I can't <laughs> Man, you're like worse than my church. <laughs> wow. You know, cause, and if you guys don't know, I mean, they would give you these little milk cartons, yeah. and on the side of the milk carton, they would say something astronomical like five cents feeds ten kids for a week or something more. You know, just unbelievable. And this is something our church brought to our attention we should do. And we'd go out and trick or treat for you and stuff and get money and stuff. And, um, you know, just, it's similar today, you know, a dollar in a third world country goes a heck of a lot longer, farther than it goes here. So, um, also as a part of the church, every year, and I don't know, I wish I remember what they called this, but someone from the financial community would pay a visit to our home and tell us what the financial needs of the church were, and you have to sign a pledge card. And I remember signing my first pledge card before I could write my name. You know, and I pledged 25 cents a week, you know, in the offering to help with whatever. And then, you know, somewhere on, in the rest of the year, they would come in and, you know, okay, now we have a special thing that we're doing. We're going to build a new classroom or we're going to build a parking lot or, you know, I remember one year it was the organ. You needed to have an organ because, you know, a church ain't a church without an organ. 
and all these different things. And by the time I was about 13 or so, and I'd gone trick-or-treating for UNICEF for all these years, the guys came in from the financial committee and said, okay, what we want to do is get a stained glass window. I'm like, okay. And now this is going to be <clears throat> like 68 or something. And they said, yeah, it's going to cost $5,000. And I was like, you want me <laughs> to contribute to a stained glass window? It costs five grand when a nickel <laughs> will feed, you know, five kids lunch. I mean, it just seemed unbelievable to me that, you know, it always cracks me up when someone's teaching and training you to do something and they don't do it themselves. I mean, they brought this whole program to the youth group to help us understand how to reach out to people in need and where our priorities were and what we should do. And then don't practice it, because I'm like, you know what? You may convince me we need an organ, which isn't true. But you don't need a stained glass window. I'm sorry, there's no way that this is important. And, and similarly, you know, when you're talking about people don't want to have the discussion, it's mostly because I don't think they know what to say. They don't have the expertise and knowledge, or they're not willing to really think it through themselves. Um, and so when we questioned, why would we spend 5,000 on a stained glass window, we got shut down. And, that, and that's all it took for me, I left the church. And I mean, that may seem small, but, um, you know, especially at that age, you know, they always talk about kids leaving the church, you know, like in the early teens and that sort of thing. You know, Dad just said it all to me. You don't really care. You have no clue what's going on. You know, uh, yes, we need to have a building and on occasion need to pay the parking lot, but when it comes down to what's really important, you seem confused. And when I ask you about that, you're like, shut up, go away. And it's not trivial, I don't think. That's a good point. Anyone else? Anyone else? Man, I could use like two days for this. Uh, here's a question for you, and I'm going to, we have a little bit of time before then, I'm going to open up to see what we get coming in. What could the church, in your opinion, what could the church do better at to reach people like you? What could the church do better at to reach people like you? You know, I think the number one thing the church could do is follow Christ. And if they absolutely just tried to follow the teachings of Christ, I don't think we'd have half these problems. I think there'd still be disagreement, because I'll tell you, you know, everyone I know has a different take on the same scripture. I'm amazed, and part of my prayer life is like, okay, Lord, I'm kind of following what I think you said, by the translator guy who has got the, you know, because who knows? I can't read the original. I don't know what it actually says. So I'm at the mercy of all these different translators and people. But I think if you try to do the basics, you know, and I hope to God, literally this is true, when Christ was asked what's the most important thing, he said love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. If you just focused on that, you know, and we weren't so condemning, and we weren't so judgmental, and we weren't so absolutely sure. We knew, you know, anybody who tells me they totally understand the Bible, I reject immediately. So I don't think there's any way we can. But if we could just focus on that, I think 90% of the problems would be gone. I'm going to add to that. Just do what Jesus said and let your light shine. And don't tell me that you're great and wonderful and doing things for me. Just do it. The Christians that I know, that I respect, that I that want to draw me back into the religion are the ones who don't tell me about it, they just do it. And like, I play in a band with a guy who just casually mentioned to me that his church puts together a huge package and sends it down to South America to a mission that they uh, support. And the only reason he mentioned it to me was because he sends a guitar and an amp every year and to a different village. And he said, that's the only letter, they, that's almost the first thank you they get. They send food, they send clothes, they send all kinds of things, they send a guitar and an amp, and that's what they get a thank you letter for. And I'm like, wow, shit, I didn't know you were that guy. I didn't know you were like that. I have a lot of respect for people who just walk the walk and let me walk the walk and, you know, try to guide people towards your life instead of dragging us, kicking and screaming to heaven. 
does that make sense? <laughs> I should say something since I'm just sitting up here. here. <laughs> um, and kind of what I'd like to say, I mean, I did not have, maybe I had a very schizophrenic church life because my grandparents were Nazarene, which is very fundamentalist and very emotional and very musical and very loud. And my parents, and I went to church with them a lot. My parents were Methodists, which really a friend of mine who was a Nazarene said that's not like having a religion at all. It's like <laughs> a social club, <clears throat> which is sort of true, you know. Um, but and, and and currently religion is such a hot issue because it's gotten so buried and married to um, politics. I'm like I'm currently not even talking to my brother because of a huge Facebook war we're having over politics and religion and where it fits into our lives and things like that. And I guess what I'm more concerned with, maybe because I had such extreme religious, like go to this church, go to that, I don't know, because I loved my grandparents, I loved the people in that church, I loved my parents, I loved my, I don't know, you know, to me it's more a problem of you love these people because you, like it's really easy for me to hate the big televangelist church because I don't go to them and I don't know anybody that goes to them and I don't have to deal with the complexities of it. I don't have to deal with are these actually good people trying to do something good and they're just accidentally stumbling really, really badly and you know they're doing actual real horrible things out there and the harm. I don't have to deal with that. I can just hate them. But um, you know the, the truth is I don't want those churches to draw me back. Um, I want them to change, you know? I want them to change. I don't want them to appeal to me. I'm going to figure out how I can appeal to them, and I have not figured it out. Because so far I've only managed to stop talking to my brother um, and have a lot of Facebook fights. <laughs> I don't know. Me too. Facebook got me here. I'm with you. I'm like, I completely, I, I am not a biblical scholar. I have tried reading the Bible as a book. I've done it several times. I'm not a biblical scholar, though, and, and I um, have never read it in the original, and I feel like maybe I don't even know who Jesus is, but I know who I want him to be. I know who I'm happy with him being. And it's very simple and very inclusive. And, you know, the churches I'm seeing are very exclusive. I, I don't even get this. We're arguing about a jillion translation, blah, blah, blah. You know, that Jesus said this or Jesus said that. I don't even get that. I do get that the message of the inclusive, um, what I think of as a social rebel Jesus, was to go out and do good. But anyway, that's me. Anybody else? I will note that, uh, just in passing, that Jesus didn't really get along with the churches of his time very well either. That's a good point, a very good point. But I, I do want to say one thing is that, that um, you know, your question was, what can the church do? And, and my comments were, um, that's a starting point. But I absolutely believe, and since we're taping this, and this is a public thing, I don't want to misrepresent what I think that there's a heck of a lot more to following Christ than just doing good and just feeding people. Um, I think, especially when people are confused or if you're looking for common ground, that, you know, uh, and you'll know where this is, I can, I'm not a very good Bible quarter. I can, I can get John 316, I'll um, But, you know, um, when he talks about feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, helping the widows and orphans, you know, reaching out to those that are sick, reaching out to people in prison, you know, this is this is the basics, and if we can't agree on anything else, we can, should be able to agree on that. But I do also believe it's not just Jesus is a good guy, let's do good. There's a heck of a lot more there, and I think there is sin. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in there's still sin, um, and maybe I don't agree with the person, you know, at the next church, what that is. But um, I, and if we as followers if the church as a whole followed the teachings of Christ and we as followers followed um, the first believers and trying to have discussion and reaching out to people and trying to, you know, uh, pray about things. You know, I, I always know I'm in trouble when I've asked pastors and churches to pray with me and they don't, you know, nobody wants to pray. This blows my mind because, again, this is, 
Um, again, one of the first things you should be doing. But um, I don't think it's all just Jesus is a good guy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. To touch on some of those times to go back and forth again, it, it, it's why that our lives and how we live and how we practice and what we believe is so important. Uh, again, I have many friends who dif disagree with me on various issues, whether, you know, whatever the sin, quote unquote, area may be. Uh, I have people in churches that condemn me because I watch R and review R rated movies. Well, I've got one for them. I review some NC-17 movies as well, so stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Uh, Last Tango in Paris, a classic film that I didn't like, is NC-17. But then there's the others that will judge me because I happen to believe Jesus' words. I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's not that we cannot have disagreements. That's not the issue. The issue is, is it, are we exhibiting the love of Christ in our lives, including showing unconditional love to whosoever? Whether they're Buddhist or gay, straight, male, female, black, white, homeless, or wealthy. I've had to learn. For me, it's, not, it's never been for me the orphan and the widow that I've had trouble loving. It's the wealthy and obese. Well, guess what? I met some rich people that I feel that love God and I got fat. <laughs> you know? But the issue is, is the, the unconditional, no matter what. And my experience is, is that we may disagree. I, I tell folks I've been married to my wife in November for 32 years. Is it 32? Thank you. Like 32 or 33. <laughs> Believe me, we have many, many dis. We get above 15 for Kendall's count. We've had many, <laughs> many disagreements and arguments and times that one of us has walked out the door. But the willingness to come back and love and persevere through that love and to try to work things out, that's, that's to me, a part of being like Jesus because He, uh, he loved whosoever. And he went out of his way, and people who disagree, and yet the church, to me, this is a little bit of a sermon, but the way that I hope Mosaic is different is that we love whosoever. I don't care if you're gay. I don't care if you're straight. I don't care if you're a guy or female. I don't care if you like Boss Gags or if you like Led Zeppelin, you know? If you like Charlie Pride, that's one thing, but the Lord will work with me on that. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, I actually like Charlie Pride. Uh, but the issue is, is, the, the passage gave, there's a passage in Matthew and then one in Mark. Love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. Of all the commandments, there's none greater than these two, for when you've kept these two, you've kept them all. And then you look at the Matthew 25 passage you looked at about the people that are poor and homeless and in prison. And uh, I just, uh, I hope that we as a church can do better. I hope that we can. The fact that we're really willing to even try to address that, I hope is an indication. Are there any questions or anything? I've got a few minutes for questions. We got If you got the paper written up, if you want to bring me your pieces of paper, so can somebody collect those? Yeah. And before we end, I do have one story. Go ahead. Really Go ahead and share it, yeah. Um, this is really funny, and it's funny how Facebook is playing into all this stuff, but um, I got um, a Facebook message from a friend that I haven't talked to for a couple of years. And um, uh, it was, and again, it kind of, I'm still kind of in shock over all this, but this is our friend from, you know, 20, 25 years ago. I haven't seen him or talked to him in the last couple of years. Haven't seen him for probably 15 years. And uh, he's from Kansas. He's a Christian music singer. Um, and he uh, sends me this message. He friends me. You know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I haven't talked to you in so long. And um, he would been living in Texas. I said, I used to live in Texas. And he sends back a message, no, um, I'm back in Kansas. His family lives here. Um, I've been really ill with pneumonia and almost died. And, and um, so I you know, lost his house, lost his car, his job, because he'd been so sick. Um, and uh, he was back with mom and dad and recouping. And I was like, wow, you know, I'm so sorry to hear this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then he says, sends me a message that says, you know, I feel like I need to be really honest with you. Um, and part of the reason I was so sick is because I'm HIV positive. 
and you know, I've been gay for many, many years, and I'm sorry I never showed up, shared that with you. And you know, he tells me all this stuff, and I'm like, well, you know, I'm not exactly surprised, but I'm sorry that you didn't feel like you could tell me, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So I asked him if he was still singing, you know, and so he sends me this message. Well, here's what happened. Um, you know, I've been in a relationship for like 18 years with someone, uh, but I didn't obviously didn't tell the church. He was part of the worship team at his church, and this is in Ohio. And so somebody, one of the pastors, there's several pastors, found out that he was gay. And instead of going to this friend of mine and saying, you know, excuse me, you know, I'm concerned about this, or you know, this doesn't go along with what we think, what's happening, or what are you thinking? He went to the church and went to this public Sunday morning service and called this guy out and like, you heretic. You stand before this church and you do this stuff in the name of Christ and you're gay. And of course my friend is like, you know, sliding <coughs> out of the chair. He's so freaked out because he had no idea that this was going to happen in the public service. And then he privately went to my friend and said, if you ever sing publicly as a Christian again, I will be there. I will be in the front row. And the minute you open your mouth, I'm going to tell everyone you're gay at the top of my lungs, you know, wherever you go. And this is a fairly well-known guy. And so he, he just shut up. He just quit singing altogether. And I, I, that just blew my mind. This is the church where he worked. This is the church that he'd been a part of for many, many years. And the, this is how the church treated him. Makes me a little sick to my stomach. Kind of, but you saw everything, you know? Yeah. I've got like four questions and I'm out of time, so I'll ask one. It's kind of, it's kind of been asked. Uh, I mean, there's other questions here and you know, they may or may not be appropriate. <laughs> Let's get an inappropriate one. Those are the best yeah, ones. Yeah. <laughs> I'll answer the obvious one. Yes, my hair is pink and it's natural. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll ask one of the. Well, see if I ask if I say if I ask the inappropriate one. And there's like two good ones in the inappropriate. Uh, two that's a little bit inappropriate. And if I ask that, they'll know. They'll think that I, they'll know who it is I'm talking about because I'll answer a question. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll, I'll maybe let me think about it. I'll ask the first one. The, well, I think it's probably the best one first. Now, it's, I've already kind of asked it, but uh, each person, just real quick, what would bring you back to church or to a church? I, the reason that folks understand this, remember the series we've been talking about, is that we we want to be we mosaic since its inception. We want to be a different kind of church. We don't want to be a church that finds out that someone is gay and publicly announces their quote-unquote sin. We want to be a person that loves unconditionally in the way that Christ has commanded us to love whosoever. And uh, we want to be that. So I understand that the reason that folks are asking these questions is so they can do a better job. Maybe, and I already know there's a ton of stuff that y'all have said that's caused them to think. So. But the question I think is probably one of the better ones, if not the best one, what would bring you back to church? You don't have to be long, but... Kathy. Kathy kind of gave her answer, but... Well, what, what I meant was... He means I brought him back to church. Uh, <laughs> he means on a very practical level, um, yeah. And, and, yes, I did pretty much give my answer. Um, what would actually bring me back to church, what does bring me back to church, is the fact that um, it infuriates me and church needs to change. And I don't know, I feel like you can't just drop out. Um, I actually really appreciate what you're doing here, which is trying to create a presence as an alternative church um, that, that does that kind of work. But So those are the two things. Uh, For me, it's way. don't ask me to divorce my sexuality from my spirituality. You can believe what you want to believe, and that isn't wrong. You don't have to change your belief about homosexuality, but I'm still going to be me, and I'd like to be in a place where I can still be me and you can believe what you want to believe, whether or it is what I'm doing is sin. That's fine if you believe that, but you can still be my friend. We can still have a dialogue. We can still talk about other issues. That would get me back. That would get more gay people back. There's a vast amount of 
gay and lesbian people who are very spiritual people, and they feel like they have to leave their spirituality behind if they want to be able to embrace their sexuality, and you shouldn't have to divide yourself. You, we were created as whole people with lots of different facets. Spirituality is one part, sexuality is one part, there are lots of other parts. Those should all be able to be in together. You believe in what you want to believe is fine, but let us be who we are, who we are supposed to be. Someone else? <laughs> you keep looking at me like... Oh, no. that's just pure Jake or Leslie, at least. Um, and it's kind of funny, when you were first sharing, Jason, about the church you grew up in, um, you know, after many bad experiences, I had a really great experience. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was like 1978, and haven't had one since then. Um, but, you know, I got involved in a small, non-denominational, charismatic church um, that really did try to live as Christ told them, you know. Um, and unfortunately for me, <laughs> I had this great experience and I just assumed <laughs> that other churches were like this. You know, I mean, this is, I'm like 18, 19, 20. Um, and, but this church took it very seriously and then we were also there, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, Friday night prayer, you know, the fun stuff, we used to, you know, and this may annoy people, but you know, at the time, we would go out knocking at doors and share the four spiritual laws of some of you. You know, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the evangelism explosion and you know, we were trained to go out and you know, if God or to if you were to stand before God tonight, he would ask me, I should let you in my head what would you say? I mean I've got all this, you know, still in the back of my brain somewhere. And that was fun and we would, you know, after that go out to a restaurant, hang out, and discuss things because it was so much a part of our life. Um, and it was community, which is a really overused buzzword these days. But that's what I seek again is something where Jesus is your life, not just you know a part of it. For years, um, I worked with a group called Compassion International, and we worked with Native American peoples. And, and um, one of the things you know that they taught was the difference between mainline, you know, white America and Native American spirituality is that for white America, religion is a part of your life. For Native America, it is your life, and that's what I'm looking for. And one other real quick thing, when we, um, some of you may know I worked with Rich Wallace, who's a contemporary Christian singer, and we all moved to Wichita at the same time together um, to be a part of Central Christian Church, which was really odd because Joe, what's his name, was the pastor, and I'm not one of my favorite people, um, but you know, we were trying to be a part of something together to do something. There were seven or eight of us that moved here. And we went to the church and asked them if they would put together a board of elders. Um, you know, Rich was always very open about the fact that he really had some issues <laughs> and traveling all the time, especially on the weekends, was really hard. We need a spiritual covering. We need people who are going to say, you know, that was nuts. Don't do that again. Or don't go there. Or, you know, think about this before you get in trouble. And, and they were like, well, okay. You know, they didn't get that. You know, I go to the elders because I'm trying to be to truly follow Christ, and I go to the elders to share something, and they're like, well, what do you want us to do about it? Uh, I don't know, you're the spiritual elders. <laughs> the Bible says come to you, so that's what I'm doing. And so even that experience didn't work out to be what it could have been. So I'm looking for a bunch of people who are really, really trying to make Jesus the focal point of their life, not just something that happens on Sunday. Anyone else? Uh, each of you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. No inappropriate question? You want the inappropriate? Here's why I think it's inappropriate. Just because I, well, it's inappropriate because, I don't know. You'll see why it's inappropriate. inappropriate. It's inappropriate because I don't know if there's a set answer to it, okay? What do you consider tithing? Anyone want to take a hold of that? What do you consider it? Tithing. What do you consider tithing? Yes. What it yeah. is? Yeah. Giving more than you think you can. I can take that one too. Literally, the ten percent thing. You know, I mean, you can't go to the Nazarene church and understand that rule. Anybody else? Here's your pastor's perspective. Is I like that New Testament approach that Gay touched on. Jesus wants it all. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the issue, the issue, the issue is not how much uh, do you have to give. It's how much are you blessed to give. But I do certainly believe that you're giving. If I'm giving to churches for stained glass windows, I'm not inclined to give. So uh, not that there's anything wrong with things. Yeah, there's nothing. You know, beautiful. If you've got you know a gazillion dollars and you want them, that's fine. But uh, I think Jesus would have been impressed by that. Though. 
<laughs> so anyway, you know, you get an idea. So thank you guys all for coming. And uh, everybody give them a hand for a welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.